Welcome to today's webinar on strategic ordering and forecasting, the second session in our USDA Foods Processing from Soup to Nuts series. And now we have two polling questions to learn more about our audience. Our first polling question is, in which region are you located? And it looks like we have people joining us from all throughout the country today with the most tied for Northeast and Mid-Atlantic with about 24% each. And now our second polling question, where do you work? And nearly half of you are coming from the school district level today, followed by state agencies at about 20%. So we're glad that all of you could join us today. And now I would like to introduce Peggy Canto, who will be providing an overview of today's presentation. Peggy is the branch chief of the Child Nutrition Operations Branch here at the USDA Food and Nutrition Services Food Distribution Division. Good afternoon. We're here to discuss a subject that is very near and dear to the hearts of those in Child Nutrition Operations Branch. In our branch, we have the order managers that monitor the orders submitted by the state, as well as work with the processors' monthly performance reports, reporting inventories and reconciling their inventories. All of us are working towards the goal to ensure that states fully order and utilize their entitlements on behalf of the school district and that it be available on an equitable basis for all the school districts, this important asset. We also have the goal of keeping the inventories at the processors in a reasonable level and to ensure that they are utilized fully within the school year within a reasonable time frame. Our goal is to ensure that all products flow through the system, whether commercial purchases, direct delivery USDA purchases, and process products move through the system quickly and seamlessly in a cost-effective manner. We do not want these items to be a liability and an asset that goes unused. And hopefully our goal here would be the best possible business partners and to incorporate some tips, forecasting and ordering will help us achieve our all mutual goals. And I'm going to introduce first, we have three topics. The first topic is uh, being an ideal customer. And it will be presented by Lene Potter. I'm going to go hit share her bio. She has over 15 years of experience in the child nutrition arena. She started as a kitchen manager overseeing on-site cooking kitchens, became a central kitchen supervisor, and moved on to become a food service director in a school district. After, when she moved to Colorado, she worked as a state as a program specialist in, with USDA Foods in the food distribution department with the Child Nutrition Program. And she is currently working in the Child Nutrition Operations Branch as Program Analyst. And she has her school district hat on and has collected a lot of wonderful tips from her own experience in procurement as a school district director as well as as a state manager and also has got feedback and input from industry and ACTA, the American Commodity Distribution Association. So with that, she's going to share tips for being an ideal customer. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. We are very excited to speak to you today. Our goal is to give you some best practices to use during this time of USDA food ordering, but also to think about your procurement processes and how to improve them. Before I begin, we're going to, we have a couple of polling questions. Our next polling question asks, how much of your entitlement do you spend <coughs> each year on further processing of USDA food? And the answer with the most votes is 50%, followed closely by 25% and 75%. So we have a good range. Our next polling question before Lenny begins her presentation is, do you use your USDA food process and direct ship inventory in the year it is received? And the majority of you selected usually in about a third said yes. So it looks like almost all of you said yes or usually for this question. So the title of our webinar today is Strategic Ordering and Forecasting. With strategic ordering and forecasting, one can become an ideal customer. So who has a role in an ideal partnership? Since child nutrition operators are tasked with the goal of being self-contained and self-sufficient, this webinar is designed to assist the state and district on how to become an ideal customer with entities that provide food for our students. We want to help develop an integrated, seamless, menu-driven program that encourages competition. Who are our partners? We have our school districts, commercial distributors, brokers, 
USDA Foods processors, as well as our state USDA food managers, all working towards feeding our children. Ideal partners integrate and utilize all sources to improve our program. Now, obviously, the first step is planning. But what if you tried to look at this stage a little bit differently? What if you treated your food service department or state agency like a small business? As food service directors, we are given the task to be self-contained and not encroach on the general fund. I know this because when I was a food service director, my department had to receive money from the general account for over 10 years before I was hired. They gave me one goal, to run my department in the black. So what is the difference between a small business and running a food service department in a school district, or serving the school district as a state agent, or even purchasing the USDA foods at the federal level? There's really not that much difference. So I started doing a little bit of research just to kind of look into what it takes for a small business. We came across the United States Small Business Administration, and they had a blog titled, The Ten Benefits of Business Planning for All Businesses. Now, I'm not going to go through all of those ten, but they could be incorporated into our program quite easily. While we understand that anyone in school nutrition is not considered a business, the benefits of doing a business plan can help create a successful program. So some of the benefits in that blog were see the whole picture. A good plan, whether it's at the state level or at the district level, will give you the whole picture of what you want to accomplish and how. If the planning is done right, it will connect the dots for you. Does your menu target the right market? Are you covering all your costs? Are you utilizing the available USDA foods? Which leads to another benefit, which is called strategic focus. In the blog, it has Focus on the target market and ensure the products are tailored to match. Will the customers buy the product? Have you tested the USDA foods to make sure these students want those products? A big benefit is that it's easier to manage change. Regularly reviewing your meal counts track progress and comparing your plan with actual analysis is critical for forecasting and ordering. With a good business plan, you should have production records in place to see if the actual counts or what you forecasted, and if not, why? If a product decreasing in count, do you need to find a new product to replace it? Do you have a commercial product available if you run out of USDA foods equivalent? Have you worked with your USDA vendor on the changes that you need? As a state agent, are the balances decreasing at the processors? What changes need to be made to help the district utilize USDA foods effectively? This leads us to the next benefit, which is develop accountability. It helps set expectations and track results to ensure you are utilizing all your USDA foods. Are your balances at the processors being used efficiently? Are all direct delivered USDA foods on the menu? And have you balanced your direct delivered product with your processed product? If your plan is to send cheese to a processor, have you decreased the amount of direct delivered cheese to account for that that's coming from the processor? And then, of course, another benefit is to manage cash, which in our case is entitlement. Are you utilizing all of your pals? State agents, have you allocated all the entitlements? And do you offer other options throughout the year to give the, offer, the district opportunity to utilize their entitlement? And districts, have you ordered enough products to send all of your pals? Once a plan is in place, how do we use that to become an ideal customer? The plan will help assist with forecasting, which is a key to successful procurement, which is the key to a successful program. A good business plan will assist school nutrition programs and achieving that successful, self-contained, self-sufficient program. So let's go over some of the best practices that ACTA has developed for forecasting as well as for procurement. Florida and Texas will also relay some of their best practices that they are using, and there will be more information available at the ACTA conference in May as well as at A&C. Best practicing when planning, 
is develop your menu plans well in advance. We recommend cycle menus to assist with forecasting. Also, know how many children eat at your school. Now, I understand this sounds really simplistic, but I can't tell you how many times I, people have actually asked me what ADP means. And are your counts increasing or decreasing? Do you know if your school district is declining in enrollment or increasing in enrollment? This means you need to know this so that you can adjust your counts throughout the school year. Communicate your important dates, like your school startup, holidays, summer. This needs to be done to all vendors and your state food distribution department, because this may impact the service. Also, use commercially commodity calculators to determine case quantities. If you do not have access to these calculators, USDA does have some general templates that you can use, but you can always ask your state agents or your brokers for these. And Florida will go over some really good tactics that they are using in their state, too. And, of course, communicate storage capabilities. This needs to be done for all vendors and to your state agents. When you're ordering, Provide as much lead time as possible. Manufacturers need three weeks lead time for production, and sometimes they need a little bit more than that. So make sure that you really work with your manufacturers and know what the lead time is. And remember that distributors stock two par levels, so order your quantities agreed upon through the bid or your contract price. Have a backup item ready in case an issue arises and always communicate your discontinued items. The next best practices is once you've got all of the planning and that, now it's time to modify. Communicate increases and decreases in quantities of plus to minus 10%. Discuss any changes to the program with distributor, broker, and processor. So if for some reason your breakfast, in the, your breakfast program is now going to do a breakfast in the classroom program, make sure you talk to your distributors and your brokers because those counts will go up once you make that change. And communicate desired timelines to add new items and whether this will replace an existing item. But keep in mind, does this impact quantity commitments? And are you still honoring the commitments with your processor? So you can see all of these best practices and all of those benefits that I first mentioned work really well with the child nutrition level. It is a continuous process which occurs throughout the whole school year. So now that we have the best practices for forecasting, now it's time to learn some best practices in procurement. Planning is always an advantage. You're going to want to develop the menu. And of course, we recommend cycle menus so that you can determine those estimated usages. Also, determine your minimum quantity to purchase. Processors like firm commitments. Do you have a specific quantity of end products that you guarantee to purchase during a specific time? And always keep in mind that some processors do have minimums if you're going to want to do a fee-for-service type of order, so you need to make sure that you have those plans to meet those minimums. Develop good specifications. This is the way the vendor knows exactly what they are bidding on. And communicate your hours of operation. The less restrictive the delivery times may increase your competition, possibly before or after hours. Maybe have deliveries on the weekends. Once we have the plan all set in place, now it's time to award your bid. Ensure adequate time for response. Please give the processors at least a three-week time for a response. And don't have it due on December 26th. And then, once you start working on it, awarding this, please do so in a timely manner. But again, remember that in bid openings or in awarding, sometimes there could be travel. So don't make it January 2nd. And plan bids to coincide with the school year. So now the bids have been awarded, now it's time to monitor them. Order foods based on the awarded bid. 
Communicate with your manufacturers, brokers, and distributors before changing menu items. And always communicate your concerns immediately. Again, this is a very continuous process. And as you can see, the benefits of having a business plan work very well for these best practices too. Now, a lot of this information will be addressed at ACTA conference and at ANC. So now I'm going to go ahead and give, let Lindsay do some more polling questions. Thank you, Lene, for sharing all those tips for best practices with forecasting and procurement. We now have three polling questions before we turn the presentation over to our second speaker. The question is, do you use cycle menus for any of your programs? About 60% of you said yes, you do use cycle menus. Our next question, how often do you access the available third-party processor inventory tracking system? Close to half of you selected monthly. And our last polling question for the moment, when purchasing commercial food, how often do you compare your commercial order to your USDA food direct ship and process inventory? The most popular answer, about 42%, is as needed, followed by weekly, then monthly, and then never. And we'd like to welcome Christy Marie. She is in the state of Florida and serves as the Assistant Director within the Division of Food, Nutrition, and Wellness at the Florida Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. Over the past eight years, she has worked in a variety of capacities within the USDA Child Nutrition and Household Program, assisting participants with the National School Lunch Program, USDA Food, Procurement, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, and the Farm to School Program. Christy holds a bachelor's degree in criminology from Florida State University and will graduate in August with a master's degree in public administration from the University of West Florida, and she is going to be speaking about data and inventory analysis and provide you with some tools and concepts. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with everybody today. I know we have a pretty large group of attendees, so I'm excited to be able to talk to everyone about what we're doing here in Florida with regard to data and inventory analysis. Here in our state, we've been working for the past year and a half on a study of the food flows in Florida, specifically relating to USDA foods, but also now expanding into all food-related purchases, whether those are commercial purchases, produce purchases, and anything like that. So. You know, although it says data and inventory analysis, what we're really talking about is adequate and accurate forecasting. And that really begins with having a complete understanding of your available inventory and analyzing school-specific data in order to accurately provide projections to those that you're doing business with and establish a, a plan of use for the products that you're ordering. The slide that's up on the screen is really just a visual representation of what we're trying to accomplish. We're looking to bridge supply and demand, and it's really important to take information and data from both sides, whether that's your menu, your consumption patterns, your inventory, any substitutions that you're doing throughout the year. All of that is going to help you accurately forecast the products that you're going to be using. I'm going to talk a little bit in detail about how you start that process and then talk at the end a little bit about what we've done in our state to help make available the inventory not only the inventory at different levels for USDA foods, but also projecting out your USDA food uses for future purchases when catalogs are open. So although it's really, the discussion is really about our USDA foods items, it, it can go to all levels of inventory and ordering. So when we're doing your menu analysis, you're looking at your commercial purchases, your USDA foods purchases, and how those things interact so that you're not over ordering and have inventory sitting at multiple levels. This slide we're talking a lot about going back to what Lene talked about earlier, number of children served. So how do you do that? Your starting points can be your point of sale data, your meal cleaning systems or your production records and looking at that information and really understanding how many students do you have in your school, how many are you actually serving, what are your participation rates. And then also going back to what Lene mentioned in terms of holidays and important dates, it's really important for you not only to recognize that there are holidays and important dates within your, your school year calendar, but how does that affect your menu cycle? Does your menu cycle for December, for example, when you have two weeks of no school, are you rolling your menu cycle through those two weeks and just not serving any students, or do you skip over those two weeks? 
because what that's really going to tell you is what you need to be ordering based on the menus that you have created for the, your entire school year. So it's really important not only to understand that there are important dates to think about, but how they affect your menu cycle in terms of your consumption and your projections for future orders. So for forecasting of your number of servings and portions per menu item, a lot of times what we tell our school districts here is when you're creating a menu, it's really important to put the information not only of total servings, but how that's going to be split out amongst a specific menu for a specific grade level on a specific day. So if you're looking at the slide, um, you want to split your menu forecast accordingly, and a, additional serving adjustments should only be done at one level. So what I mean by that is if you look at the information presented here, this is one day's menu for, let's say, um, an el elementary aged school. So you have your item number, your manufacturer item, and then your description of that product, and then you have what we're calling our splits. So knowing that you may have 17 or 20,000 students that eat in your school district, not all 20,000 need to be served all entree items. You need to split that out over the percentage in which you know from past historical orders or what you anticipate if it's a new item or something that you may not have as much information about and split that over the course of your different entrees to ensure that you're accurately forecasting for that amount of product. And then additional serving adjustments. So when we talk about additional serving adjustment, just having an understanding of where that happens or where that could happen, where you're padding your numbers. And it's okay to pad your numbers at certain levels because you want to ensure that you have adequate food. However, what you don't want to do is compound the issue where if you've added a few extra servings to this charbroiled beef product to ensure that you have enough, you don't also then want to add more at the school district level once you've rolled up all the cafeteria projections as well as at the distributor level so that then the manufacturer has a significantly overinflated order anticipation when really it should be much less. So just being cognizant of where you're putting those adjustments in and making sure that you only do it at one level. So menu items, what you want to ensure when you're looking at your menus, ensure that all units of measure are taken down to the smallest common unit of measure. For our inventory and projection tool that we've developed, we have all menu items brought down to total number of ounces within that item. So this is just a sample of some units of measure that you may see out there within different data sets that you'll want to bring down to an ounce. So a unit of measure shouldn't be necessarily a meatball, it should be how many ounces are in that particular meatball for that particular manufacturer or item. Again, with looking at um, kind of, I guess, moving more on to forecasting your USDA foods. So once you've analyzed your menu, you've gotten everything pulled together. We in Florida, we have incorporated all manufacturer line items for the manufacturers that work in our state for all as items on the SEPDS sheets into a single database at the state agency level. And we utilize this database tool to assist our recipient agencies in forecasting and planning their USDA foods entitlement. So I'll show you some samples of what that can look like um, for your state or for your school district as in the next couple of slides um, and some of the reporting capabilities that you could potentially see. So always start with your beginning inventory when you're looking at forecasting for your USDA foods. Um, you also want to look at any inbound shipments in WebSCM that have yet to arrive at their destination location. Know what your drawdown is for each menu grade level, each menu cycle, and each item, which again kind of goes back to that menu that we looked at and knowing how often that menu is going to cycle throughout the calendar year, how many students you're going to be serving, and then rolling all that up into a projection. And then, of course, looking at your SEPDS sheets to know uh, what your drawdown for all of your products for your USDA food process items will be is very important. So forecasting for USDA foods, just one, I wanted to make one small note on here in terms of inventory drawdowns. They may differ if you're using a district or school-developed recipe. So if you have a recipe that you've, you're using multiple manufactured items, and a manufactured item might say that it's one serving, However, you're not using a full serving for that item in your recipe. You need to account for that when you're doing your future projections and your forecast. 
So if you look at this OCPS pizza, which is about five lines down on the left-hand column, and this is just a middle school menu. You'll see MS2 at the top, middle school cycle menu 2. And then you have manufacturer item, the number of meals anticipated to be served. And if you look in that other middle column, which says portion size, you'll see a .2231. And basically, that's all that's telling you, that this pizza does not require a full manufacturer serving of that item in order to meet um, the recipe needs. So you want to account for that so that you're not significantly over-ordering that particular item based on the manufacturer serving size versus what you actually need in that recipe. So just something I wanted to mention as you're developing recipes in your school districts and looking at the SEPDS sheets that it's really going to depend on what your school district is doing to make sure you're accurately projecting what your needs are. So in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to briefly talk about our inventory tool and what we have in our state that helps our recipient agencies understand what USDA foods are available for them and what their balances are. So if you look at the left column, it identifies the manufacturer and, the, and then your web SEM item number, your web SEM description, as well as your carryover pounds for this particular school district, your school year allocated inbound pounds, school year available pounds, which is just a combination of the two prior columns, a total year-to-date usage, and then a balance for those items for each manufacturer for each product. Again, just another report that we pulled together for a particular district so you can see all of your cheese from different manufacturers at one snapshot. So again, looking at this specific district, all of the different cheese items, all of the different manufacturers, the item numbers, and the product itself along with the total, total pounds. And like I mentioned, inventory visibility is really important in, your, in projecting out. So understanding what you have before you place orders is extremely important, especially with USDA foods, so you don't sit on large inventory balances sitting at processors or sitting in state-contracted state or SSA-contracted warehouses. So this final one that I have is really just showing a state agency perspective look at a who a manufacturer is, what item number, I guess looking at the item number here and then the type of product that it is and what county it actually belongs to, whether it's in our state account, whether it's in a specific school district account, and what the pounds are so we can have kind of a, a single snapshot at, of that. All of this basically rolls up to our final USDA Foods ordering projection tool. And what we're looking at here is just combining everything that we just talked about, all the way down from your menu and analyzing those menus to ounces, looking at how it affects throughout the school year, how many servings you're going to be doing throughout the school year on each cycle menu, and rolling all of that up for all schools within a district into a total projection that you could put into your USDA Foods catalog orders when they become available. So right here what we're looking at is just your starting inventory for a particular processor for a particular item, starting inventory, and then just projecting out how much of that product you're going to use throughout the school calendar year. Starting with your, like I said, carryover from prior year, any inbound allocated pounds that you've put in, and then how that's going to affect you throughout the year. So as you can see, that green line at the bottom will show you your ending inventory up to the point where you start getting into that yellow and that red where it's going to tell you that you're going to run out of that product around that point if your consumption continues to stay as planned. And then also letting you know if you need to order more of a certain product, if you're going to have excess of a certain product, just so that you can make better determinations on utilization of your USDA foods. And also just to let you know as well of when you might go into having to buy something commercially versus using a USDA food if you don't have any more entitlement available, any more pounds available from your account. So the final slide that I have just talks about the overall process for accurate forecasting. And basically what you're wanting to do is increase your process knowledge. Know what, you're, what you need to be looking at in order to have an accurate forecast as well as increasing the level of detail in which you're determining your menu needs, working with and communicating with your dietitians and your nutritionists and those that are developing your menus, as well as those who are ordering your food. So that's really important. And your suppliers, having really great supplier partnerships and communications. So just increasing that detail, 
increasing your process knowledge, understanding how the supply chain works, and really leads to everything in the right-hand column with procurement efficiencies, cost savings, reducing waste, having more money available for, to promote your local farm to school programs. Again, like I said, all of those together really make for a great forecast for those that you're working with. And now we have two more polling questions. And about three quarters of you selected yes. You do provide good estimated quantities. And our next polling question, do you commit the quantities to order when you award a contract for food purchase? About 60% of you selected yes, and about 30% no. Elizabeth Gonzalez from the state of Texas will be following up with some more planning tips and concepts. Elizabeth is the director of the commodity operations for the Texas Department of Agriculture in Austin, Texas. She oversees all the food distribution programs and the WIC Farmers Market and Senior Farmers Market Program. Elizabeth has been a member of the ACTA Processing Committee and is currently serving as the Southwest Regional Representative on the ACTA Executive Board. Elizabeth has shared some Texas fun facts for us, and she wants us to know that the first word spoken from the moon on July 20th, 1969, was in Houston at the Air Space Center. Another fun fact. Texas comes from the Hassanai Indian word, Texas, meaning friends or allies. Thank you for those facts. Come in handy with Trivial Pursuit. <laughs> Go ahead, Elizabeth. Great. Thank you, Peggy, and thank you for inviting Texas to be part of today's exciting webinar. Uh, today I'm sharing information we have presented to schools in the last several years regarding best practices on planning their requests. From this presentation, you'll see that we are consistent with the message we just heard from USDA headquarters and Florida. Uh, we ask schools to plan their requests by first ensuring that their USDA foods are incorporated into their menus. If the person ordering the USDA foods is different from the menu planner, be sure to incorporate a process for the two to communicate with each other. We also ask schools to review their line items, be versatile in the products that they are requesting as USDA foods. For example, ordering an item such as chicken fajitas, whether they're regular or processed, allows a school district to serve it in several different ways, increasing their menu options. As we point out in this slide, a school could take chicken fajitas and make it into taco salad, fajita tacos, quesadillas, or fajita rice bowls. And the same could be said for beef crumbles. That's also an item that's very versatile and can be used in several different menu ways and coordinate regular processed and commercial purchases. If the USDA foods and the commercial purchasing duties are separate from the district USDA foods manager, have them work together to coordinate and forecast all of the food purchases. This will help the district become more effective in their overall planning and forecasting process. Commercial processed, which is your finished end product, and regular, which is your direct ship USDA brown box, uh, should be well integrated and complement each other and not be redundant. For example, order commercial products and local items or fresh items in conjunction with your USDA assets to ensure all inventories rotate and keep moving through the system consistently. Uh, this way you won't stop ordering a commercial or, or bulk process finished item or hold a USDA direct item in storage because you have the other identical item in stock already. In this slide, Let's take a look at potatoes that are, that's in the first line item. This is a great visual on how a district might become redundant in their ordering process if they don't compare all of their food purchases as part of their planning process. For example, a school might order potatoes as a commercial, process, and regular item or through those channels. So be sure to compare all of the types of products you might be purchasing through these channels to avoid over-ordering any of these items. Same for your tomato products. Be sure to compare anything that you might be buying for those as a commercial or process or regular and making sure that those aren't redundant as well. Procurement forecasting and solicitation. In Texas, the most recent communication we provided to cooperative leaders here in Texas and schools has been with regard to including quantity in their solicitation. We held a meeting with the cooperative leaders and gave them a general procurement overview with forecasting being a hot topic of conversation. Since that meeting, we have had um, many follow-up conversations, not only with the co-op leaders, but schools and industry as well. 
So why include forecasts or include quantity in your solicitation? Well, as you heard from USDA, forecasting is a key to a successful procurement process and accurate ordering of your USDA food assets. Including quantity is also a standard practice in the commercial world, so it's important to sync your commercial and USDA food purchases or processes to be consistent as much as possible, uh, and it's also part of the procurement and ordering process. Uh, forecasting requires you to plan and project your request for further processing along with your regular USDA food items. Knowing your estimated quantities provides industry with an estimated amount of volume they can expect schools to be ordering from them in a given year. The estimated quantities also helps industry with their production plans and reduces uh, shortages or any potential shortages if they have that information ahead of time. So one thing we're learning is that quantity alone may not give you better pricing, but coupled with the things that I just reviewed here in this slide, it could lead you in that direction. Monitoring inventory. Texas has continuously relayed monitoring as a best practice to schools. To piggyback on USDA's message, being an ideal customer involves monitoring your existing inventory, which means accessing the third-party tracking systems that are available to you, including monitoring your existing inventory you might already have on hand at your district or at your state contact at warehouse. A district should incorporate monitoring as a routine process to ensure they're not ordering the same item they requested in the prior year, or at least verifying that the current balances are not excessive so that you don't overorder an item that might have a high balance or low usage. In other words, don't just order the same item and quantity year after year without looking at your current usage and your inventory balances. Incorporating this process should help minimize carryover inventory from one year to the next. And monitoring is also important to ensure that you're ordering and using the products that were awarded for further processing. As you can see at the bottom of this slide, Texas has a policy that allows carryover, and many states have implemented similar state procedures in their states as well. And Texas' previous year carryover balances must be used by the end of November. Otherwise, the unused balances are swept from their individual accounts and moved into a state account and given to other schools to use, or the inventory could be used to fill future orders. In Texas, we definitely, definitely have seen this week policy as a great motivation in having schools implement better planning of their USDA foods. So as a best practice, and just to recap the best practices that I just mentioned, it's important to forecast to order appropriately and use an inventory timely, an ideal customer, as USDA mentioned in their presentation. I'm now going to turn that over back to USDA. Thank you so much, Elizabeth, for sharing all of those best practices from the state of Texas. And we will now open up for questions. One of them is, what is the best approach to ordering timely? And I'm going to let Lene respond to that. Well, it's really going to be, be dependent on your state system as to whether or not they have you doing all of your ordering at the beginning, like right now or if they have you do a lot of your ordering of USD foods continuously throughout the year. However, the one thing that you do want to keep in mind is that we really ask the states to spend about 100, 105% of their entitlement, and by, the, by September, most of that entitlement has been spent. And so that's really kind of what you want to look at is in the beginning, go ahead and do all of your planning and try to spend as much of your entitlement as possible. Um, just because towards the end of the school year, it is harder for the states to build big trucks. And so then you may not be able to utilize all of your entitlement. So right now is the planning time. Get your Figure out what your USDA foods that you want to order. And I think we have another question. What is par level, and that was in the topic one? Yeah, that's what um, distributors, when they have certain products, they know a rough estimate of how much their customers are going to order, and so they like to keep those um, the par level up. So they like to have all uh, that many cases on hand at all times. So when you are all of a sudden ordering more or start ordering less, then that um, affects their PAR level. So that's really what a PAR level is. It's really what the distributor wants to keep on hand to make sure that they are able to fill all their orders. There's a huge responsible for enforcing the 48-hour receipt. 
That is on, there is a memo out there, and um, I can get that memo. I have that in actually readily available. Us as specialists, we will go ahead and run reports approximately five days after the delivery period to see if there are any or the orders that have not been receded, and then we will contact the states to make sure that those items have been receded. And a lot of that is because we want to see if there's any issues with the vendors or if there's any issues with the deliveries. There really isn't any enforcement. It's just that I know that AMS, they're not able to actually pay the invoices until they are yeah. receded into Web FCM. So yeah, that's but why the, it's, it's the receiving organization's responsibility to receive within the 48 hours. So the state needs to be responsible for that, but we also kind of work with you guys on it. Well, it depends on who's defined in web. The processor could be defined as the receiving organization. Okay, we have a question about the turkey balances. Referring to Texas sweep policy and procedures. And if you are a school district from Texas, Elizabeth. Yes, so uh, those we were, we did give a, an exception to the carryover policy for any poultry processor that was impacted by the avian flu, and that was communicated out to the school. But if uh, they have further questions or concerns, they can definitely email us, and we'll be happy to review that with them. Uh, we have another question. Do we have a preferred vendors listing? Um, USDA at the federal level does not do such thing. We have. The Agricultural Marketing Service has USDA-approved vendors listed on their website, as well as FNS has the um, list of the national processors that are approved listed on our website, if that, that is helpful and responsive. Another question is, we would like to learn about all aspects of ordering commodities, forecasting, and direct deliveries. And that said, um, there are several tools and uh, webinars available that have been done in the past about the order cycles and primers, and they can find it on our website, the, the primers. Other questions? Okay, we do have a question. Although I know it is a best practice, I find it hard to use the cycle menu especially when you don't know what you are going to receive from the USDA, how do you do this? One of the biggest things that you want to do is always make sure that you have a commercial equivalent as a backup. For the most part, we uh, our USDA food procurement, we are able to purchase, I think it was at one point, like 98%. On time. On time. So as long as you are um, ordering the USDA foods, we are able to go ahead and fill those, and so your cycle menu should be easy to manage. And again, as long as you have a commercial backup, then you should have no problems doing a cycle menu. I have another question that's very similar to that. It says, I can't track my USDA shipments that the state orders and what information is available. Again, if you're, you are not in a real-time request-driven system, online tracking your food orders. There are some tools available on the USDA website, the Food Nutrition Service website. All the um, orders are posted monthly for the nation to respond to information requests or people that would like to do trends. But it also identifies the sales orders going into your state warehouses. So if you don't have access to real-time information and an idea of what your USDA regular direct shipped items are. If you know you're receiving warehouse and you go to that USDA website, it's under the WBSCM, Web FCM, and you can see your orders. Now, again, you would have to ask your state to let you know in real time when that will be available to you, but at least it would give you an idea of what your USDA foods are and when they will be arriving in your state warehouse. There is one question on do brown box items save money over commodity process? Unfortunately, we are not able to answer that question because that's really state dependent. That's going to be dependent on what your delivery charges are for getting your direct delivery versus your process and how you have that come into your state. So that's really one of the things that you really want to look at is you want to compare the cost of what your distributor 
fees are going to be coming in from the processor and also what your distributor fees are going to be from your state warehouse or if you get it direct ship. Those are just some things that you're going to have to look at on yourself. Unfortunately, we're kind of biased because we think both all of the products are really good as long as it's USDA foods. What are the best practices pertaining to RAs accessing pounds from a state account? Each state is a little bit different as to what they want. I know that as when I was a state person, I wanted um, transfer forms, and I wanted to be aware if it was coming from the state account, who it was going to and why and what it was going for. But I know that every single state has their own processes. Elizabeth? Yes, thank you for that question. Just as Lene is saying, every state is different. In Texas, we do this year started sending out reminders all through October, letting schools know that the sweep was coming up. But if they know in advance that there is a situation that they have that's unique that caused them to have inventory that they could not use by the end of November, they can certainly email us that and we'll take a look at it. And if it looks like it's a justifiable request, we will give them an extension. Any pounds that are swept into the state account, there is a process where we'll look at schools who, with the, let's just say a particular process or inventory was swept into the state account, we'll look to see if there are schools that are currently, that have zero uh, balances, they've used all their inventory when they can use more to finish out the year, we can allocate that to them. Or the schools can just simply email us and we'll put them on a list to consider giving them some of those pounds. Our primary focus there is that we're looking to give those pounds to schools who need more pounds to finish out the year. They've, they've been really diligent in using their pounds effectively and then using those pounds to fill future orders if we don't have that situation. But communication is always the best factor there, even though there may be a process. It's just email us and we'll look into it. Okay, so do you have a philosophy of what gives you the biggest bang for your buck when allocating commodities? Christy, what do you tell your districts? I guess it would depend on the context of the question, but I think really it depends on each school district and what they feel. We offer a lot of flexibility in our state, so we really want the schools to be able to select the items that are going to give them, you know, the most benefit for the school district and however they want to allocate that out, whether it's a specific type of product or a specific way to use their entitlement, whether it's DOD or direct ship or processed items. So. I don't really have a great answer, unfortunately, I'm sorry, but it, other than to say definitely if, if it's a school district asking or an SFA, that at the state agency level we really try, and I can probably, I know Elizabeth as well and I'm sure most, most all state agencies really try to help our schools as much as possible, so just call us if you have any questions and we'll be happy to kind of help you walk through that process. And we've got another question. 75% indicated that they have quantities on their solicitation, but it sounds like we're unsure if it will get better pricing. Are there any other tips to get better pricing? We are doing some research with industry and trying to peel that onion. And again, as I think Elizabeth indicated, the jury is still out on the impact of putting quantities on the solicitation. Many people in the industry refer to this as basically solicitations are fishing licenses. I do understand that there are issues and guaranteed minimums are also one way to encourage competition and potentially get breaks in pricing. We're going to be, again, continuing to work with industry to develop specific practices to ensure competition and ideal pricing. Long-term contracting and guaranteed minimums are, are one strategy that we've been hearing from industry. Thank you very much for participating this afternoon.